proud of our church this week. You've been so generous. You always are. Um, we were able to, on Tuesday night, um, for our kids that come to the community and everybody in the community, uh, the Ignite Young Adult Group went around the community and made sure that they were aware that they could come here and get spaghetti and that they could get their backpacks and supplies, thanks to you all. And we told them a little bit about, around our, about our church and maybe a little bit about Jesus, right? And so thank you for your generosity, consistent generosity, I should say. The, the spaghetti was so good, I walked around talking with an Italian accent for a week. I said, Mama Mia, all week long. It was great. So I'm really excited today. You know, um, uh, I'm going to preach from a very unfamiliar uh, passage. And what happens is with a lot of pastors, there's, there's two types of difficult uh, scriptures to read. One that's very familiar, right? One that you know, you've heard of. Even if you don't go to church much, you know about, right? Because it's hard to get something fresh and new, it seems. You worry about that. And then there's, sometimes there's a scripture that nobody, you've never read, you didn't know about, or didn't know much about. And it's like, man, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. Today, I think, the passage we've got today, I want to talk about a guy, a young guy named Eutychus. Everybody say Eutychus. Eutychus, right. And so um, we're going to be in Acts chapter 20. And I want us to check out what the Lord has to say to us today. I really believe that every time we meet. And I believe he's got something, the man, that might change your life. I believe he, he wants to pull a lot from this, this kind of uh, obscure uh, set of verses that we have today. And I really believe, man, if you're lost or directionless or hopeless, whatever it might be, that you have an opportunity today, to, man, to be rescued by the Lord. I believe he's going to show us all something today. So I believe today's message is going to help. It's going to be in Acts chapter 20. We're going to start in verse 7. Now, listen, let me talk to you a minute. I always put my notes on the screen so that you can have been doing it for 10 years. I'm just nice like that. And uh, that's important. It helps you to kind of uh, jog your memory a little bit about what we're talking about when you think about it later this week, right, and in the future. But what I want to happen, I want to get to the point where you're taking your own notes, that, that this should be the minimum that you get. So, so there's a difference between seeing the notes on the screen and then going after yourself with what you hear, okay? So get creative in how you take notes. Uh, I don't care how you take them, really. Uh, we've got some, I think, uh, some were created, some cool revolution uh, notebooks, and you can have a pen, or just get something from the store and bring it in. But let that be your thing where you go that you're listening, man. You're not just watching, you're listening. And that you write those notes down for yourself, right? And take you on a deeper relationship with the Lord. So Acts chapter 20, verse 7. This is what the Bible says. It says, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Everybody say bread. bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day. He's leaving the next day. Spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Everybody say midnight. Then it says, there were many lamps. Everybody say many lamps. Many lamps in the upper room where they had gathered together. And in the window sat a certain young man named, e uh, how did y'all say it? Eutychus. I'm just making sure y'all listening, right? And he was, sit he was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Moving on to verse 10, it says, But Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him and said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, then he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Now, all that means is, I'll say it again in a minute, not a little comfort. It's just a new King, new King James Version of saying that they had a lot of joy. Okay, so that's, that's the long way of saying it. I don't know why he just didn't say that. But it says, and they were not a little comforted. So they were really excited about that, that he actually lived. And I know this is a very strange message, uh, set of passages that we've selected today. But I, I want to talk about this, and I want to kind of, if you're titling your message, you're titling your notes, uh, we're going to title this one, All In. Everybody say, All In. Now look at your neighbor and say, I'm all in. Now if they looked at you weird, look at your other neighbor that you like better and say, I'm all in. There you go. Okay. So today I want to talk about being all in because it's just not time to be 
half in, okay? Would you pray with me? And I'm going to pray for you. Just bow your head. Father, thank you for your word today in advance, Lord. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask the Lord that you give us plenty of clarity today, Lord. Move on hearts, transform lives, God. Uh, speak into somebody specifically, God, that uh, we ask and invite your spirit to be with us today, Lord, and uh, ask you to anoint the words that are being said today, Lord. And we know that our best days are ahead, uh, ahead of us, God. And um, Lord, I want to pray for the person that feel like that their time has come and gone. God, that they're convinced that you're done with them. Lord, help them to know that you're not, that you are not finished with them yet, Lord. So we say all this in your son Jesus' name. If you believe God can do that, say amen. amen. All right. So in this text, we're about a third, where we're picking up is about a third, the last third of the book of Acts, okay? And the first, 12, first chapters between chapter 1 and verse 12 are all about the apostle Peter, another guy that we're not even talking about today. Peter was awesome. He, God raised him up to preach at Pentecost and just really did a mighty work in his life. But now it, the, the, it kind of shifts to, uh, as soon as you turn from chapter 13 to, uh, 12 to 13, and, the, and all the chapters through chapter 29 are all about Paul. Okay, you just said his name a little bit ago. Paul and, the, and how God worked in his life, man. And it's going to be awesome to watch here. And if you don't know Paul, his name used to be Saul. Okay, it used to be Saul, but he was walking on the road to Damascus. He had this reputation uh, for um, killing Christians and persecuting the church and hunting it down and breaking it up and, and making sure that it happened. He hated God and hated his people. And, but one day, he encountered God. And, um, and, and Jesus was with him face to face. And what Paul talked about was seeing a seeing a light and hearing a voice, right? And he did that, and it changed his life forever. And the question that he asked the Lord, uh, and, and the same Lord that he had been persecuting, right? Uh, the question he asked him, uh, and before I say that, is um, the way Paul was, he was the Jew of all Jews. So he was really smart, educated in Jewish culture. He was high on the ladder. He knew everything religiously, politically. He had a lot of clout. Everybody knew him, right? So he was a powerful, powerful Jew. But he had this encounter with Jesus. And you can see this in Acts chapter uh, chapters 9 and 10. You can see that. If you want to know what just a uh, um, a rapid transformation that God can have on you. Uh, go back and read Acts 9 and 10 and you'll be able to see it. But he asked him, he asked him two questions that are really important. I think it's one that we all have to ask. I wrote, them, wrote these down for you. Uh, it's number one, it was, who are you, Lord? When you go back and read it, 9 and 10, he says, who are you, Lord? And what do you want me to do? Right, that should be all the questions that we have constantly. God, I want to know you more. If you already have a relationship with him, I want to know more. What's the next thing that you have for me to do? Um, and sometimes when you enter into a relationship uh, with God, sometimes you have uh, less answers and more questions. You don't always have it. So it's always that question to God, what do you want me to do next? That posture of saying, who are you? I want to know you more intimately. And what do you want me to do? Uh, because a lot of times we have this pre-prescribed kind of idea about God. Is that, God, if you provide this thing for me, if you do this, if you open these doors, God, then I'll start to follow you. I'll start to, then I'll start to do what you say. But that's not the way a disciple does it. A disciple comes in kind of like with a contract with no words on it yet. Just the bottom line where they sign it and take it to God and say, God, whatever you fill in the blank. I've already signed it. I'm committed. You tell me what to do. So... I want to tell you that the, one of the, the greatest um, times of your life, if you're able to discover it, man, with uh, pursuing God, is, is following Jesus with everything you've got, man, that you abandon uh, these things in your life and kind of abandon this um, trying to pursue your future so much, right? They, they see what God has for you. And you ask that same question, God, I want to know you. And I want to know why you put me on the planet because I want to spend the rest of my days following you and what you've called me to do, right? So whoever told you, if they have, or if you've been experiencing this, that it's, that Christianity is a dull religion. Man, I, I challenge you to read Acts, all of it. And it's so full of drama and it's exhilarating, and it's exciting. It's, it's just awesome, uh, awesome uh, book to read. So I wanted you to get this point, is if you're bored following Jesus, listen, you're doing it wrong. 
You're doing it wrong. There's something. That's a check engine light. If you're bored doing that, let's talk. Let's uh, take me out for a steak and let's talk about it. And we'll get to the bottom of this, right? Because um, it is not, boy, you're doing it wrong. And if you decide to follow Jesus, man, he'll start to fill you with your purpose. I've heard that word so much the past maybe couple of months. Just people looking for purpose. I don't have purpose. They're depressed because of it. They're anxious. You know, they don't know what to do with their life. And that's the question that we all have to answer, though. And when I'm able to, and I have permission, I say, hey, man, you have a relationship with God. Because he will fill you with that purpose, right? So by the time we get through um, to Acts 20... Uh, because um, Acts chapters uh, 13 through 29 is the unfolding of the story of Paul and his life. And it's anything but boring. Paul gets a couple of nicknames you'll hear it sometimes. He's known as the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Because it used to be just Jews were God's children. I said, no. And he came along and said, no, it's for everybody. Right, so they call him Apostle to the Gentiles, and they call him Apostle of Grace. He had all these nicknames. But this guy's been through some stuff. Paul has been through the ringer, and I don't know about you, but how many of you have been through the ringer about some things in life? You've had stuff happen to you, right? And you've had some experiences, and, uh, and I want to kind of get real with you. I decided to is that, man, when it, when it comes to somebody feeding me and leading me, I want to know they've been through something. I don't want them to, to whitewash it and sugarcoat it, uh, like their life's perfect and that's it. I learn better. I connect better. I'm more interested when I know that you've been through something painful, right? You've been through some things in this life. And, and so uh, I want to hear about your challenges and your struggles and being betrayed and going through trials, right? Being left for dead when, uh, you know, and, and abandoned by people. But still get up and do for God. Still serve God. And I want to say to Paul, man, what do you got? to keep going because this is hard, right? So those are the kind of people that I think are easier to, to, to learn from and to be fed from. And Paul's been through so much, right? He tried, they tried to murder him. They tried to kill him. Poisonous snakes were trying to kill him. I mean, everything. He's gone through some stuff, but he's still preaching. And I don't know about you, but this room full. Now, I had hoped that I, I repeated a few words so you can look at the details of that scripture that we read earlier. But if I'm these disciples sitting in this upper room, right, this big upper room, I'm hanging on every word, right? I want to hear everything that Paul's got to say. So the first thing I want you to see, and I hope everybody kind of grabs this, what I'm about to say is this group of people in Acts 20, they're in this upper room. And let me talk about that just for a minute. The upper room, we talked about that usually around Christmas time. We'll talk about how, um, you know, um, when Jesus was coming to earth and uh, Mary was pregnant with him, they go to the door and they said, we don't have any room, we don't have any room. And uh, they were going to places, they usually have three floors, and the one on top, the best one and the biggest one, uh, was called the upper room. And that, was, uh, that room would have been better than your room in your house, right? That's your three-story house. Your bedroom's not as big and not as nice. That's for the guests. That's where they come. And so we see in Scripture, man, constantly God's people meeting in an upper room. It means somebody hosted them, right? And so they're, they're up there, and that's, that's the room that they're in. It says it's an upper room, right? And I want you to notice this about these group of people in this big upper room that were there, and that they had the spirit of receiving. I'm going to talk about receiving a little bit. And what does that even mean? And what it means is when the Apostle Paul started speaking, they started receiving. They came expecting, hopefully like you did. And I want to really challenge the view you have for church and God's word and being present, all of those things. But they were ready. They couldn't believe that Paul was actually here speaking. They couldn't believe that all the things that he was going to say, they were eager and willing and ready, almost like they were looking forward to it. But I want you to hear this. I tried to write this in a way that I could understand it so I can relay it. But hear me very carefully that you will never be more spiritual than you are scriptural. Now, that's not a point. But that's a place to, that you might want to take a note. You'll never be more spiritual than you are scriptural. What that means is, listen, your capacity to hear what God says and to do the amazing thing that God does is limited. It creates a capacity at wherever you're, you are scripturally. Right? Do you crave God's word? Do you consume it? Do you read it and look for it and around it? Uh, because 
the victory in our life, a lot of things we look at is, I mean, what is, qualifies as victory? Is it having a house? Is it having an education or any of those things? But I've found that it's connected to our willingness and ability to receive God's word. Okay? That's it. And I couldn't help but pay attention and base my whole message around this room. Okay? This upper room and where they were. And the Bible says that they were gathered there in the upper room to hear what Paul had to say. And I started thinking about rooms. And this room has the Apostle Paul in there. Amazing. It's got these hungry people. And the Bible says that they gathered to eat bread. Now, this is fascinating to me about this bread part. I've been studying for my own, not even to teach about, but just for me about certain things I'll get hooked on. And one of those is bread, how important it is to know the, the symbolism of bread in Scripture, right? It's why we have communion, and it's part of that. But there's something powerful about bread. Now, I want to kind of cover real quickly, uh, if you don't believe me, how important it is. Uh, in Luke chapter 24, verse 13, I want to kind of tell you what happened there. And you can go back and read it. It might be titled, The Road to Emmaus. And there were these two guys that were really looking blue. They were sad and depressed and walking down. And this is the day that when this takes place is the day after Jesus was resurrected, right? He was crucified. He was put in a tomb. He was raised from the dead. They went and just tried to look for him when the stone was rolled away and he, his body wasn't there. And so... These two guys are walking down the road and Jesus passes them. And he says, why do y'all look so sad? You look broke down. What's going on? And they said, well, we are sad. We are sad. You know, uh, uh, I don't know if you've heard about uh, Jesus uh, came and he did all these miracles. He taught so much about God and heaven, sin and heaven and hell. Uh, he taught so much about it. But then he was crucified and now they can't find his body. And Jesus said, really, tell me more. So he told them more about it. And so Jesus walked with them. And so it, he started talking with them and teaching them. And Jesus was talking about everything from Genesis to the books of the prophets about, um, about, about him. Okay? So don't let anybody tell you that the Old Testament is obsolete or not important. It's all about Jesus. It all points to Jesus. And Jesus uses that with these guys. And they still don't know it's him. And Jesus himself is walking with them and talking about this. And it, it's interesting because the only revelation that Jesus gave the disciples, these disciples was from the Old Testament, right? So, so he goes and tells them everything. And the Bible said that he was about to go on. So they're about to break off uh, with one another, about to go to their house. And they knew Jesus was going to keep walking. And so they compelled him. They said, listen, listen. You've taught so much. You've talked about everything. We're so interested. Why don't you come to our house? Let us host you. All right, you come here, get you some sleep, and go the next morning, you know, something like that. Come to our place. And so they get to their place, and, and they're, they're trying to host him, and all of a sudden, this is just crazy. I love it. It's only in Luke 24. And while they're in the middle of hosting him, all of a sudden, um, the Bible says that Jesus got some bread and served it to them. So it went from, from Jesus being hosted to him actually changing it to them, to him hosting. It's an awesome concept, and I really thought about it and prayed about it and what that means is, and I really want to make the point here. I, I want to challenge what you think about church. I want you to challenge about, I, want you, I always want you to value the church and value God's word, and I want you to crave it, all of those things. But what we do if we think about it, you know, sometimes instead of, uh, it, it might change how you think about you just being here, is when we're here, what we're doing is hosting the presence of God. That's what we're doing, right? We're inviting him in. We're, man, we're worshiping him. We're making him feel elevated because that's what you did. That's what you did. But the guest is you, is you elevate them. You honor them. And that's what we do. And isn't that a lot different than are you going to church today or not? Well, I'm a little tired. I'm a little busy. It's a big week coming up or I just had a rough week or I've already been two weeks in a row. Why do I need to go back? What if you put it in a context of, man, I'm hosting the presence of God. How does that change it? How does that, that, that change what's going on and how we look at it? Because here's what happens, man. Have you ever noticed this? That you're in here, we're hosting God. We're we're uh, welcoming him and singing about him and to him. And then, but something happens, right? We're hosting him. But all of a sudden, somewhere in the service, maybe it's during the message or during, during the worship time, all of a sudden, God starts doing things in us. He starts feeding us, right? 
You're in here. Now you're getting fed. I thought we were just here to host. No, he changes it and he shows this example here. And so they start, they start being hosted. And I love it about Jesus if you really start. He, he, he has a nickname for himself. He calls himself the bread of life. Because what does bread do? Bread fills you up, right? It's a part of when you gather. And he says, I am the bread of life. Now, I didn't give you notes. It's one of those times where you have to say, this is a good place to take notes. It's John 6, 35. Let me read it to you. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life who comes to me. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He's the bread of life. That what he means is when, man, when you're connected to me, I'm going to fill you up. That's what I do. And when you worship him, it's not just about you pouring out, right? I feel tired sometimes. I'm sweating up here. I had to put the fan on my shirt because I'm pouring out. I'm pouring out. But it's not just about us pouring out. He'll bring you bread. He'll, he'll, uh, he, he brings bread to hungry people. And I hope that every week you show up hungry, right? So the Bible says when they ate the bread, when they're gathered there, Jesus flipped it on them and um and they were there let's see what was i gonna say oh yeah so they were gonna eat the bread and they did and the bible says that their eyes were opened when they ate the bread bread of life being around jesus he says their eyes were open so they started to see things that they couldn't see before right and that's where we kind of pick up in Acts 20. It's in a, hung, uh, a, a big room, and it's full of hungry people, and Apostle Paul's there. He's full of revelation. He's got a lot to reveal to them. So how they follow Jesus more closely, how they do church, how they live this life that God gave them. And the point is that you need to hang out in rooms where the bread is. Does that make sense? There should be bread in the room, and there's bread in their room on that upper thing. This is a big deal. They're about to hear from God. And in our life, we need to be in rooms with bread in it, like where we're going to get filled. So does that change the uh, dynamics of what life group means? Because when you go to life group, you're getting fed. When you're here, you're learning more. God's trying to reveal things, and Paul is trying to reveal things to them. It's also about this room, and it's midnight, right? You told me. I said, what's that word? You said midnight. And the Bible says that the room was full of many lamps. Say many lamps one more time. Many lamps, which means, man, that even though it was dark outside, there was a spirit of revelation on the inside, right? Happening on the inside. And if you're taking notes, the first word, I try to do uh, alliteration a lot. So uh, uh, the first one was received, right? They had this spirit. Man, I'm ready to receive. I, I'm coming expected. I'm, I'm, I want to know what God's got for me. He didn't bring me all this way for nothing. I didn't get up when I could have slept in. I know that God's got something for me. So the first one's that. But here's the second one is the spirit of revelation. Revelation. There's a spirit of revelation in the room. See, there, the Bible said there was many lamps, which means there was a lot of illumination, a lot of light in the room. The light was really, really bright. And don't miss this. It's really important that you stay in rooms that are well lit. You know what I'm talking about? Darkness and light. It's important to do that. That's what happens. I know it's a little dark in here now, but you know what? It's, it, it's, there's light in here, right? So you can see. What happens when you have light? You can see better. You can see things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to see. And there's all kind of crazy stuff going in the world, and I didn't need you to, you didn't need to come to church to, know, to hear that because you know it. You just got to stick your head out the window and see, man, it's crazy out there. There's chaos, right? It's confusion. It's just crazy. Um, but this is a room that's well lit and it's imperative that in your life that you stay in well. Man, I, I go to church because God does something to me, gives me something so I can see better, man. So that I can, uh, uh, so you, know, you might ask me, well, Richard, what's revelation? That sounds very churchy. I'd like to know. And I love that. I love that we pause and kind of explain things. And I'm glad you asked that. Revelation is an unhiding, Okay. An, an unveiling of something, right? Something that was hidden before, but there, and that's what revelation really means. And I love, I think it's really interesting in Ephesians 1.13, Paul is um, writing to his people and speaking to his people, and he tells them, hey, when I heard about your faith, man, I, you know, I heard about it. I prayed, that, I prayed that you would get spiritual wisdom and revelation. I'll read it to you. Paul said this, from the first time I heard about your faith, that y'all were following Jesus and learning about Jesus and doing church the way, you know, uh, uh, God had uh, uh, wanted, I began to pray for you earnestly. That means often 
and, and really intently, that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that you would see that, that, that you would experience revelation, that you would see things that you never had seen before. And the reality is the Holy Spirit is not a spirit that hides things. The Holy Spirit is one that unveils. The Holy Spirit reveals things, right? And you've got to know that, that the Holy Spirit um, reveals things that, that your mind couldn't do on its own. You don't have the capacity to do that. There's something that's the Holy Spirit that Jesus said we have when we enter in a relationship with him that you can't understand until you do. Because if you did, you'd already done it. Because it meant it guides your path, it illuminates things. You can see things that other people can't because they're living in darkness. This is why so many people walk around in the dark because they're not connected to the Holy Spirit. They don't know. And, and, it, and it's like this. It's like, you know, you can see down the road, but the Holy Spirit can see around the corner. Okay, that's a good way to, to think about that. So when I say get in a room that's illuminated where revelation is, that's what I'm talking about. And revelation, it comes from a word, you know I'm going to look it up. as a word like, man, that's got to mean something. And I'm going to try to pronounce this. It's apacalupsis. Y'all say apacalupsis. <laughs> it literally means unveiling. Really revealing, right? And unhiding. And so this is what I'm trying to say. So write this down. Sometimes I try to write a phrase that makes me get it. Or, or think harder about it. It's this. Be in a room where God is revealing and unveiling things that were hidden so that you don't walk around in spiritual darkness. So there's a reason that you come to church. I don't want to be in spiritual darkness. I want to know what's going on around me. I don't want to be blindsided and walk around in, in darkness. I hate dark. If you, you'll catch me, man, if I'm at your house, I might actually turn the light on. Because I got vision problems. I walk around in the dark a lot. So I like as much light as possible because I don't want to fall. I don't want to stumble. You know, I don't want to miss nothing. I don't want to miss that roach running across the floor. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm stopping. I'm stopping. I'm on TV. I can't. I just do that on the first service. But be in a room where God's revealing and unveiling things so that, that, that were previously hidden so that you don't walk around in spiritual darkness. And listen, I'm thankful for education. I think it's great. I'm a beneficiary of it. It's, it's really helped me, and I believe it's a gift from God and all of that. And I still try to pursue some, you know, education. Uh, there, there's nothing bad about it, but we're talking about something deeper than what your brain can absorb, right? It's more than that. It's not just educating your brain. And how many of you know, man, there's some really educated people that are fools, right? Have you ever met those people? They got, sometimes they got Ph.D. or D.R. dot sometimes right and i didn't say you said richard that is mean and is un that was offensive i'm just telling you what the bible says the bible says that and i'm just studying the bible and it says in psalm 14 verse 1 this is what it says the fool has said in their heart there is no god right now i've met people man that were the most uneducated people you know i've, I've seen a lot of people in my life and talked to them and they're so close to God. That does not equal, though, that they don't have a relationship with God. I mean, they're so close. They're blazing. I mean, they're on fire. And man, you know, they, they never went to school or anything like that, but they got a strong prayer life. They experience joy. They can barely read, but they have peace. They have successful children because they pursued God. And, they're, and man, it, it, it's something more than education. So don't, don't ever equate education and revelation, okay? They're two different things because write this down the holy spirit wants to bring illumination to you that's what it wants to do every time you decide to meet whether it's at church at that scheduled time uh, if it's life group at that scheduled time or when you're at home and you could have cut on the tv but you decide i'm, I'm just going to think on the things of god i'm going to read his word every time whatever that is he wants to meet with you to illuminate new things things that you never saw before because that's the job of the holy spirit to do that and watch this this is a spirit of, there's a spirit of illumination in this room, this upper room where they are. And they said they had many lamps. And, and here's the deal. We need to get around people who are lamps. Somebody that knows God's word that can help you along with it, that can maybe tell you sometimes what you didn't want to hear, but you know it's straight from God. Those are lamps in your life, right? 
Those are lights. Those are the people that help illuminate. So however you got to get around that. Maybe you need to break the ice with somebody and say, hey, man, can I meet with you? You don't have to be my official mentor, but can we meet a time or two and just talk about where I am? Because I really feel like you're pursuing God, and I feel like what comes from you comes from God. So I'd like to be there. So everybody say lamps one more time. All right? And if you are you are a lamp, and you know, like, man, I'm, I'm not bragging them, but I, I've, I'm at a point in my life where I need to help other people. I need to illuminate their lives. So won't you offer that up when you see it? So anyway, in, in, the, in the context here, it's midnight, and we're living in a culture of midnight, aren't we? And it dark, it's a dark world out there. But what God wants us to do in, 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 in us is this. is I've, I've really been thinking about this. You know, things are bad. They're bad, and they're desperate and all those things. But I can't believe it's a Christian's job. I don't want to be us known for this. It's somebody that just curses the darkness, like, it's bad out there. Isn't it? And just go around and tell everybody how bad it is and how everybody, everybody's bad. That is not. I don't think it is. And I, I base that on what Scripture says. The Scripture says that we're a city on a hill. That we're a light that can't be hidden. So instead of just cursing the darkness in, of this world, listen, God's called us to be a lamp. He's called us to be a light to that. So let that change some of your thinking, right? It doesn't make you more holy just because you, you got eyes and you can see how bad it is, right? Because if I was somebody, I'd say, duh, yeah, it's bad out there. You don't have to be know the Lord to know that, right? But the Bible says that, man, we're to, to be a light, to be illuminated. So maybe you could ask God, that could be one of your prayers, is to say, God, would you pour oil into me, God? Uh, pour into me, Lord, so that I can be a lamp. Put people in my path. Give me opportunities, God, to be a lamp for you, right? Y'all still with me? Okay. So Paul's in this room, and all these people in the room, there are many lamps, right? It's really bright in there, and Paul's giving it all he's got. Every word, every syllable he says, man, they're hanging on every word, right? Uh, and the room's really illuminated. And, um, but listen, he's got to leave the next morning. There's just a few hours left. It's midnight. He's leaving the next morning on a long journey. He's walking, right? And it's going to be a long journey. So there's it's something you've got to understand is that we don't have time. Time is precious right now in this text we're reading. He's leaving the next morning. Listen, there's not enough time for us to waste in this point in life, right? God's called us to live in this, this time period that we're in. And, man, I believe the days are over when you can just be indifferent and wasting time. God, I feel like God's going to close the door on some of the opportunities. Not his love for you and the ability to save, none of that. But just that opportunity to do what he created you to do, right? And I've been studying a little bit just on my own. And I'm not trying to get no degree, and I don't want that. been studying eschatology. And all that's just a long, fancy name for end times. Because using Revelation, I got, you know, a thought about it. I, uh, I dabble in it every once in a while just to see what it says. And I get overwhelmed. And, you know, well, the, the beasts and the mark of the beasts and all this stuff. I'm like, man, Revelation is just scary and, and tough. And I'm learning some things already. And really, that the... The book of Revelation is not about monsters and mark of the beast. I mean, it's, it's in there. But it's about Jesus coming back. It's revelation. It's saying this is about Jesus coming back, which is a good thing. But there's no time to waste. There's no time to waste. And all this pontificating that we do about politics. Is anybody else sick of that? Just sick of it. Are you like me? I'm so sick of it. And Paul knows he's leaving the next morning. He's doing the best he can. He's pouring it all out. And most of them are taking this, this, all this in. But this one dude, the Bible says this one young guy who I want to talk about today. So all I said so far has been the introduction. All right. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have long to go. Sorry. And here sits this young guy, his name's Eutychus. Everybody say Eutychus again. All right, I love Luke in this text. He's really intentional, pretty amazing observations that he has. And he says that this young guy's sitting in the window. And we kind of didn't know that from a surface. You know how you do the Bible, you just kind of read it at the surface. You know, he didn't really have to mention a, a window or anything like that. And the window's the only place in the room, though, that you can be halfway in and halfway out. Right? And Eutychus is sitting in this window. And when you sit in a window, you have the kind of the privilege to see all the awesome stuff that's going on. It's being said. It's being talked about. Right? But you're also postured 
right? Unnecessarily putting your place yourself in danger. I'm going to explain that a little bit. Write this down. To be half in and half out is posturing yourself for unnecessary danger. Half in and half out. I really believe those days are coming to an end where you're half in or half out. Are you, you follow Jesus or not? Is this your church or not? Are you going to act on the skills and abilities that, in the time that God gave you or are you not? I really believe it's going to, that, that, that's coming to a close. And let me tell you why it's so dangerous for Eutychus. Because on the inside, you know, there's lamps and illumination. It's amazing. But on the outside, it's midnight. Right to his back, it's the darkest time. It's midnight. So I want to talk to you. I'm about to get biological on y'all, right? Biological on you. And every person in here has a circadian rhythm. I'm going to talk to you about what that is. It's, it's not that big a deal. Um, when I first learned, when I was in graduate school, they said, whatever patients you have, whether they're little kids or elderly people or veterans or, you know, whatever population you work with, they're going to have sleep problems. And so you need to be prepared in therapy to teach people sleep hygiene and just kind of what gets in the way of sleep that they can help before they get med on medication or instead of medication. You've got to kind of understand some of these things. And all of us have this circadian rhythm, right? And it's, it's, what that means, it's impacted by the environment, right? It, uh, we, we all have it. No matter how good or bad you sleep, you still have that rhythm in you. And here's what happens with that. Uh, the way it works is this, is in the morning when you wake up, or you're not even awake yet, but that light beams through the, maybe it's just a little slither in the blinds, but it hits the back of your eyelid, right? And what that does is it starts this process in your body, right? Your blood pressure starts to go up. Your blood sugar starts to go up uh, a lot, uh, right? And, and, and all these things, the body just starts get, to get going, and it's waking it up, and it's making it get ready for the day. But then the, guess what happens at night? When it starts to get dark, right? When you're exposed to darkness, your body starts to shut down slowly. Your blood pressure goes down, blood sugar goes down, all the things start to happen. Your heart rate goes down, and you drift into sleep, right? That's what darkness does. It, it makes you drift to sleep, and that's what it is. And that's what I want to tell you, that the Bible says that Eutychus has slipped and sunk into a sleep, all right? It wasn't like he just said... But he was over there nodding off, right? You know, trying to stay awake. Like, man, it's, it's getting late. I'm getting tired. And, and the Bible says that he sunk into a, a sleep. And the darkness starts messing with his circadian rhythm, right? And so I want to tell you this. When you drift, I wrote it down for me. It's really from my notes. You can't control the fall when you fall asleep. So he's going to fall three stories here. And here in a room with the Apostle Paul. And the darkness is right outside, right over the back. It's so prevalent in his system that it rocks him to sleep. And I felt like, man, every time I'm up here, I try to say, man, what am I, what am I in here to do? What's my goal for the day? And I, I, I don't know, maybe somebody needs to hear it. This is kind of where you're at. And this is just God just kind of trying to communicate to you that you need to get all in. You need to get all in. You need to get out of the window. Man, if there's darkness in your life, you're exposing yourself to it. Get out of the window and, and get out of the influence of darkness. There's a lot of things in our life that the influences that, that is darkness, okay? And, and, and so the first thing I wanted you to see was that spirit of receiving. Do you have that? Do you come in ready or is this something like you're checking a box or, man, you got other things to do. This is just one of the many things that you do. Are you ready? Man, do you come in hearing and listen, looking forward to it, you know, wondering what amazing thing God is trying to communicate through you, whether it's through the message, through the worship, or whatever it is. So the first one was receiving. And the next one was revelation, right? Being in places where God is feeding people, where he is trying to fill you up, that's illuminated. Man, maybe this is a plug for life groups. That's what they do. 
when you go in, it's an opportunity for things to be illuminated for you. When you come here, do you view it like that? Are you hosting the Lord? Because if we welcome him and man, we're, we do that, man, he comes in and starts hosting us and pouring into us. He just flips it, flips it on us. And the last thing I want you to notice is that Paul moves from revelation, all that teaching and feeling, feeling the crowd up. Everybody's getting so full and they're experiencing so much illumination. But he moves from revelation to rescue. Rescue. There's a lot of religious places that are called themselves church where people come in every Sunday and they've fallen. But then they leave fallen. They leave fallen as well. I love this part that Paul did by example. Could you imagine I'm, you're preaching this sermon and somebody fell out the window over there three stories. Am I just going to keep preaching? And I bet they said, oh man, that's bad, but, but Paul, you're in the middle of this. This is so good. This is the best message I've ever heard. Right? How do you do that? And it, So the Bible says that, that he went out. He went out because here's the way religious people do. They're fine, man. As long as, long as you got a good sermon, they get to hear, they get to go home this week, and it, there'll be a good one next week. But putting it into practice, Paul left and went down three flights of stairs to tend to this guy, and he checked on him. He went down there. He looked up at all the religious people. He was like, he's good. You can read it. He said, he's fine. He's going to make it. He's alive, right? And then it said he came back up. And started teaching again. I'm like, I couldn't do that. I'm done. If something that dramatic happens here, I'm not getting back up here. Right? I did that one time with the old place, the, the YMCA and the fire alarm went off. Some of y'all remember that. This was 10 years ago. And uh, I went back up there and preached it anyway. After we all, I thought everybody was going to go home. I did. I thought, they go outside. It's like school. I'm skipping school once the fire alarm goes off. I'm out of here. But you know, not one person left. They came back in. And uh, we sat down, and um, everybody sat down, and we did it. But that's as far as I go with fire alarms. With somebody falling out the window, you know, I'm done. But anyway, he went out to rescue, man. And I, I want to encourage you. Um, because when you stop, when, you, when we, it's, there's always a time for revelation. I think we meet so often. Every time we meet, we're, the room's illuminated, you know. God's Word's always being taught when it's life group are in here. But there's a time to move to rescue. We've got to get out of here. Right? We can't just sit here. We've got to apply what we learn. And Paul showed that. He went out and met his needs and got down there with him. And I just started thinking, some of you have fallen. You know, you're not Eutychus, but you, you feel like you've fallen. Man, maybe it's choices you've made. You feel broken. You feel hurt. You feel all of those things. But I want to encourage you with this next set of scripture, man. This is really good. Because a lot of you, man, it's, just, it's not what it used to be. You, you got too close to darkness. You, you were, you, you're, you've been to church and you see all the illumination, everything that God's doing, but you're so close to this darkness. You're sitting in the window too long. But Proverbs 24, 16 says, Though a righteous man falls, that's one that's trying to do what God's called him to do. Though a righteous man falls seven times, they will rise again. That's really good news, man. If you've been out of connection with God and distant from God, you've made some decisions and mistakes along the way, you made a mess of your situation. That scripture's really good to encourage me to say, man, you're not disqualified. Because Jesus rescues. You know, Jesus is busy doing a lot of things, but he stops for the fallen, man, and his people should too. We're supposed to mimic Jesus in our life. So you're not disqualified, and, and the message is to know that Jesus is a rescuer. Now, I looked up Eutychus's name. You know I would. I'm going to have a name like Eutychus and me not know what it means. And it's Greek for Eutychus too. if you fell three stories. <laughs> Sorry. That's, that, that's the, you know, it has like one and two definitions. So the second one is this. Eutychus means, did I just ruin the moment? Did I just, I was about to get saved. Oh, 
Eutychus literally means one who is blessed. Isn't that awesome? I felt like the Lord wanted me to communicate that, make sure that's as clear as I could, is that you can be fallen and still be blessed. Would you write that down? You blew it, maybe, maybe, you know? Maybe you did. and You, you got too close to darkness. You sat in the window too long. You weren't in illuminated rooms enough. You didn't get filled up enough. But God's not finished with you. God's not done. And I love the language that the Bible uses here. The Bible says that Paul, when he went down three flights of stairs, he went down there. And the Bible says he fell on him. You know what he did when when you when people fall, you you fall on them. You embrace them. That's what we do, man. I, I can't think of a there's great churches that are doing amazing things. I love it. I can only worry about what we're doing. And man, there's no shortage of opportunity to fall on people that have fallen. To embrace people that have fallen. If, you, if you're not doing it, you've just been in the window too long. Right? There's plenty of opportunity by, by, uh, for that. And the Bible says that Paul embraced him. And he looks up at all of them and says, don't worry. Isn't it awesome that you can say, don't worry. He said, he's alive. And I started wondering, how did, how did Paul know? How could, could Paul tell? he was going to live, that he was alive. It's because he was the one that was willing to get close enough to, to feel his heart, to feel his pulse, right? Are you close enough to feel people's pulse? How can you get involved? Because the days are just sitting, man, I'm, I'm glad you're here and I won't treat you any different. You know that. If you never show up to nothing, I, I, I'm just glad to see you. But man, what, what a short changing of yourself and just a self-sabotage. Not to experience God in his fullness and what he created you for. To step into a purpose. One that maybe you try to coordinate your future and your purpose and it, it's not usually not the same as what God's future and purpose is for you. And I think we've got a, a really good way to do that. There's a male and a female already in the back that are ready to... Um, to talk to you, maybe about where you are spiritually. What's been going on lately? What are some scriptures that might be helpful, that might be, might illuminate your life, right? That was just a little kid saying, amen. His message was so good. They heard it in the nursery. They just couldn't wait to get in here. Listen, man, I wish you wouldn't leave. Don't do that thing where you just numb out until the song's over and you leave and get some pelicans out there, right? But that you say, man, this, today's when that stops. I, I need to do what God's called me to do. I need to be in the rooms that are illuminated. I need a life group. I need to be at church. I need to rearrange some things and restructure things in my life because I'm walking around in darkness. And you can't see when you walk around in darkness. But the Holy Spirit can illuminate that, man. What a benefit for you and your family and your children, your grandchildren, to be connected to God and having access to the Holy Spirit like that.